Hello, I'm Stephen Dawson, one of the pastors here at Emmanuel. Thanks for joining us on the high point of our Emmanuel gift campaign. It's the gift day! And I say it with enthusiasm because I have been praying and thinking about this moment for a few weeks. And maybe you're a bit like me. Maybe you've come into church today enthused by the fact that it is gift campaign. And you can come and give your offering. Maybe you've even grabbed your envelope already. And uh, you've put in your cash or you've written your pledge on it along with I Heart Jesus all over your envelope and you just can't wait for me to finish talking so you can run forward and put your envelope in the container. Or maybe you're not feeling as enthused and maybe you've got here and thought, oh whoops, it's gift day, I forgot that was coming. Or maybe you're thinking, hmm, I'm not necessarily feeling enthusiastic, it doesn't really feel like a thing of joy it feels a bit more like filling in my tax return or filling in my universal credit form. It's a bit of a drudgery or a bit of a dullness in your life. Or maybe you're here thinking, oh, that's right. Church talking about money again after my bank account. Well, whoever you are, my prayer is that as we look at today's passage, as we unpack it together, That each of us might be helped, might be encouraged, might see what's in God's word and see that it's for us. It's for our heads and our thinking, for our hearts, our affections, but also for our actions and our worship as well. It might inform them, it might even change them as well. Because in reality, in the Bible, we see lots of things that on the face of it are not that pleasant for us at a natural level. We look at the fact that God says that we are bad, but in our nature. That we need judgment, that we deserve punishment, that hell is hot and forever. That we are to surrender all to the Lordship of Christ. Things on the surface don't necessarily warm our hearts and want us to respond in worship. But as we encounter Jesus... As we allow the Holy Spirit to begin to do a work in our heart and lives, we come from death to life and our eyes are open to the fact that these are beautiful things, things to be embraced, part of God's glorious story of salvation, of sanctification and goodness for you and me. That what once seemed like foolishness becomes for us wisdom and salvation. This is true for radical discipleship that we're called to. If you are concerned If you're concerned and worried that Jesus might be after some of your money today, let me tell you the bad news. God is not after some of your money. He's after all of it. I've said this before. God wants all of your life. He wants every breath, every step, every heartbeat, all your skills and talents and energies and yes, all your money. He cares about it all and what you do with it. And he wants you to submit it all to him. And if you're not in Christ yet, today's worship of offering money to God may seem weird, might even seem wrong to you. But for those who are in faith, in Christ, this is a joy, a part of what it is to live out the life that God has for us. Realising that God deserves all of us. He deserves it all, that nothing less is wrong. And to give it is true freedom, is true joy and fulfilment. Jesus says, if you cling on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for him, you will find it. Today, as with each sermon we preach here at Emmanuel, we take a part of our life and we look at it and see how we can bring it unto more full surrender to God, knowing that is what is right and good, not just for our worship for him, but for ourselves as well. Generosity isn't something we have to do, it's a privilege to do, as we seek to be more like our divinely generous Heavenly Father. This isn't just for those who don't yet know Jesus to learn about, but even for all of us who are on our journey of faith with him. Coming into faith, we then need to begin to address the various parts of our life that God wants to make more like his son. As I was preparing for this message, one of the commentators that I read said this, A revolution is needed in the hearts and heads of believers to move from this is mine defensiveness to freedom in generosity. Reluctance to give is nothing new and can sometimes be the last place in our life to get converted. Even for the believer, this subject can be a tough one. We might even subscribe to it in thought, but it takes something more in terms of the heart engaging and responding to God. We're going to have the passage read to us in just a moment, but let me tell you what one of the verses says right now. It says, each of you should give what you have decided 
in your hearts to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We actually preached on this last year as part of our March gift campaign, that particular verse. And this is very clear. We are to be those who decide in our hearts what we will give to Jesus and to the mission that he's called us to. Don't give and don't give the amount that I tell you or anyone else tells you. That's something you need to decide for yourself before God and with God. But to make decisions, as with any decision, we need data, we need information and we need context. So hopefully today as we unpack this, we'll find that there's information, there's data, there's context, there's inspiration even from the Spirit and in the the words of uh, the Bible to help us to make this decision in our hearts. The Bible unashamedly talks about money and how we give, and therefore we do too at Emmanuel. In the letter we're reading from today in uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul gives 15% of the letter over to talking about the points about money. Two out of the 13 chapters to this, addressing this, point after point, breaking down what it means for Christians to live for Christ in the way that they use their finances. But don't worry, I'm not setting off on a trajectory to tell you off and to even give you the hard sell to give today. Really my prayer and really as I preach, I'm hoping that you are encouraged, that you move into a greater sense of freedom and liberality around this subject. Because really, the context for us here at Emmanuel is very similar to the context that Paul was writing into. He says of the Corinthians that they are generous and he's able to boast of their giving. I want to tell you as a pastor here at this church, I too am so grateful for what God has done in this church over decades, even before I joined this church, in terms of making us a generous people. That when I talk about the church finances elsewhere in other settings, I can boast, I can point to what God has done in this church and in the people that they are generous, you are generous and have been over many years and decades. Look back to the pandemic where we couldn't even gather together, we didn't have the usual services and services uh, of the church and people could still give faithfully, feeling moved and stirred by God to decide in their hearts to be generous. But although Paul boasts in the kind of generosity of this church, he continues to encourage them and equip them for this amazing act of worship. Hopefully as we preach and you listen today, you will be encouraged and equipped as well. And although ultimately this is an act of worship about something about our relationship with Jesus, it is also helpful and responsible to know where our money is going. When we take that seriously as a church, you can find our termly financial reports online. We want you to know where your money goes, how it is spent. And uh, this particular offering, this time around, is called Time to Plant, about planting churches in other locations. So we've been doing this for many, many years. We come back to it because we want to take the gospel to the ends of the earth as our Time to Plant gift campaign video has shown us. Where a bit like Corinth, Paul was encouraging one church giving to another church. Here we are one church giving to not just another church, but several other churches and actually other ministries to help the extension of God's kingdom. about telling people the amazing gospel of what Jesus has done. We also do this in the context of being a church that has done this for years. We have planted churches as a church. We'll talk about that a bit more as we go. But also part of New Frontiers, where we're not just concerned about our neighbour, those who live in Brighton and Hove and Shoreham, but we're concerned about the nations, neighbours and nations. People we never are going to meet, maybe never will meet until eternity, who care about them knowing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what this church here in Corinth was doing. That's what we care about as we go into our offering as well. But without further ado, let's listen to today's passage and then we'll unpack it together. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. 
for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission flowing from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words of scripture. Thank you they are your words to give us life, to give us encouragement, even to challenge some of our current thinking. We pray, God, as we unpack it together, that you might line us up with your priorities and uh, the things that you want to do in the world, but also the things you want to do in our own hearts and lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul starts this section at the end of his larger section about giving by saying these four words. The point is... He's basically saying, in summary of all the things I'm saying about giving, make sure you listen to this. That those who sow bountifully will reap bountifully. Those who sow sparingly will reap sparingly. He takes this agricultural term and kind of of, uh, illustration to make his point. That we are to be those who are be generous, to be bountiful, to give abundantly so that we might see uh, things come back the other way in bountiful terms. He uses this kind of natural kingdom uh, terminology to show us something about the supernatural kingdom of God. Taking these principles and applying them to giving and to the way that we live before God. He's saying the unstoppable and the inevitable natural law is also applied into the spiritual realm as well as spiritual levels. This harvest principle works in the world and in our faith. We've called this um, gift campaign Time to Plant, but we could call it actually Time to Sow, because that's very clearly in this passage here, that what you reap is based upon what you sow. If you reap generously, you will also, if you sow generously, you'll also reap generously as well. And here in Corinth, Paul is talking about this church giving an offering over and above their normal giving. We see that in Paul's first letter to Corinth, he said to them, you make sure you store up once a week uh, what you are going to put aside for the offering to God. Regular giving is part of what we do here at Emmanuel. We encourage every member to consider what their regular income is and make sure they give first to God. That's the principle C in scripture. And we say a good place to start is 10%. It's not the where to end, but that's a good place to start. Look at what I receive. Maybe it's weekly for you. Maybe it's monthly for you. So I'm going to give 10% of that to the Lord's work. But as uh, in Corinth, we also encourage us as a church. So we go over and above and we do that three times a year, giving offerings. That's not something we as elders came up with. We see it in the Bible where we look at particular things that we can give to. And Paul, to help them with this, uses the language of farming and particularly with agriculture and sowing and reaping. And uh, this imagery for them is easier to access than for us. There's not many of us, I'm sure, watching this and listening to this thinking, oh yeah, that's like that farming I did this week. Not many of us do that. Most of us are working in coffee shops or offices or in our homes. But here this would be very much part of their community life. Uh, But what's helped me to engage uh, with this imagery is by watching Clarkson's Farm. And uh, not that I saw the passage and went and watched it. I've been watching it with Emma anyway. And we just finished season three. And it's really helped me to understand a bit more about farming and this particular imagery. And so I'm going to pepper it uh, throughout uh, my sermon. You can go and watch Clarkson's Farm on Amazon Prime for yourself if you wish. I quite enjoyed watching it. Maybe you will too. Uh, Watch out for strong language. Little warning for you there. Please don't send me emails about it. Anyway, I'm not going to use this as an opportunity to paint Jeremy Clarkson as God in our story, but I would love to take us to the character of Caleb in this series. Caleb works on the farm. In fact, he's probably more like the farmer than Jeremy is in reality in this TV show. And it's good because Caleb does not own the farm. He does not own the seed and he doesn't profit necessarily from the harvest that he's taken. But as a farmer, he is invested He loves what he does and his sense of satisfaction is deeply intertwined with how the farm does, particularly in terms of the yields of the harvest at the end of it. As I was watching, I was thinking, yeah, that's a bit like us. We are working on God's farm. We are invested. It's not our seed. Ultimately, the yield is not ours, but we're involved. And it's where we find our purpose and our joy, our fulfillment, our purpose in life. Even our eternity is intertwined with how this farm works. 
I've enjoyed seeing it mapped out on our own lives. We live in a world that is not ours, but belongs to God. And God is inviting us into sowing and reaping, into the great harvest that he is involved in. It's uh, his farm, his seed, his tractor, his yields, his fields, etc., etc. But as we look at our lives, we realise that none of us are self-made. Everything we have is God's. Our life, our breath, our families, our opportunities, our skills, our natural resources, our brain power, our strategic ability, our wisdom, our people skills, etc., etc. They all come from God. It's him who has given them. It's who, we who are just are stewards of it. We are employed, as it were, by him to steward the things that he has given to us for his glory. And when we begin to grasp this, if you're a believer, say, yeah, I know that. I know my life is ultimately given by him. We begin to live in that way. It no longer becomes, I suppose I should serve. I suppose I should worship. I suppose I should give. We suddenly begin to think a bit like Caleb on this farm. Hey, actually, how can I start farming? How can I get involved with what God is doing on the earth? In fact, in one part of the series, Caleb says, farming is not my job. It's my way of life. He's saying, this is who I am. I'm a farmer. I love what I do. It's where I derive my pleasure and fulfillment. In the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, in the, in the chapter before this one, Paul points to the Macedonians who say this, they pleaded that they might be able to give something. When we realise that this is God's work we're involved in, that all we have is him, as we plead with God, say, God, I want to be a giver like you. That's who I am. Generosity isn't something that they begrudgingly take part in. It's who they are. It's who we are. It's how we are to derive our joy and fulfilment. Let me just have a look at a couple more principles about being farmers. Farmers are those who are purposeful. This is not amateur hour. This is not about our back guards that we may or may not attend to. Now, this is something about livelihood, something about life and sustain, something we're commissioned to do. It's not just a window box that we might tend to when we remember about it. No, it's something we daily are involved in. Here, Paul talks about being bountiful and sparingly. Not necessarily words we use every day, but bountiful meaning about, kind of abundant, uh, being generous in the things we do. And it's a very beautiful thing. In one sense, we could park it and say, well, bountiful and sparingly, is it just a mathematic thing when it comes to farming? Well, the more you sow, the more you get. That just makes sense. But Paul doesn't say that. He uses these words that kind of drop images of beauty and of joy, things about attractive character. When you meet people who are generous, not just generous with their money, but generous in their demeanour, there's something attractive about that. Equally, when we see someone who's stingy, see someone who's sparing in their dealings with us, particularly when they have the ability not to be, it's, it's the opposite. It's unattractive. Maybe just think to the uh, image of Scrooge from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, Michael Caine playing it in The Muppets' Christmas Carol. It's this kind of stingy character that's not attractive. It's the opposite. In fact, it's repulsive. And uh, Paul here is saying that if you coming to your offering, feeling stingy, feeling miserly, do not give. God does not want those who think they can just give enough or giving something is better than nothing. No, giving something is not better than nothing. Often giving something can be worse than giving nothing because the heart is stingy. The heart is wrong. We're just trying to cover the bases. Paul said, no, we want to be those who give generously, give cheerfully, not just generously in terms of amount of money, but generously in heart, cheerfulness, joyfully, not overly calculated. Giving is like sowing a seed. The one who sows sparingly cannot to have, hope to have anything other than a meagre harvest. We're not to be those today who expect a meagre harvest from our meagre offerings. No, we need to be those who are generous in heart, no matter how big that might be. For some of us, our big offering, our generous offering might be very small compared to other people's, but it's about a heart work that God is looking at here. Giving from the heart is a response of love, not one that is over-calculated. Now we want to be good stewards, but when we look at our heart, we want to feel like there's a kind of a generosity or freedom around it. One student might say, I will give when I start earning. Or another person might say, when I'm off benefits, I will give. Or another might say, well, I'll give when I'm earning more. The Bible says that, no, people look at what they've got and say, got God and say, what can I give? We see that again in chapter 8 when the Macedonians said, they gave out of their poverty, out of their lack. They still wanted the joy of being involved with the offering. 
The most joy-filled people today walking out, I'm sure, will be those who have this freedom in their heart around the things that they have. They may have looked at their bank account, they may have stewarded well, but ultimately it's been an act of generosity. Another, another kind of farming principle is you don't eat all your seed. Don't eat all your seed. And you could take the things you've got and going back to our farming analogy, make bread out of it or pasta or make beer as Jeremy Clarkson does or maybe use it to feed your cattle. But wise farmers hold back some of their seed so that they can sow for the future. That's what the wise people do, that they might have, uh, the, live out the harvest principle, knowing that seasons come, seasons come, seasons come. We need to be ready for the next one. Again, today, we can keep back all that we have, but God says, no, don't. The wise Christian, the wise follower of Jesus, sows into the kingdom. Another one for you, another kind of agricultural principle, is that it is yearly. There is a seasonal nature of sowing and reaping. Maybe you've had the feeling today, as I've mentioned, the gift day, as I have had at points, it was like, how is it another gift campaign? They come around so quickly. Surely there's 10 a year, not three. I promise you, it's three. But they sometimes come around quickly. Well, Paul has something to say to you as well. In his letter to another church, Galatians, he says, let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. Maybe you've been kicking around Emmanuel for a few years, maybe even decades, which means you have sat through many messages like this. You've given many times before. You think, really, I'll be going again. The Bible says, don't give up. Why? Because in season, you will reap. You will reap a harvest of righteousness in your own life, in the kingdom of God, and in eternity as well. The harvest principle is core to the gospel. Jesus says in John 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Jesus is here explaining to his disciples in agricultural terms what is going to happen to himself. They don't even know what's going to happen. He's just beginning to tell them. And he's saying his life is like this seed that if left on the side, won't do anything, but needs to be buried in the ground. Like Jesus dying upon the cross and being buried in a tomb. Why? So that life may come. If it stays on the side, that, that seed will just stay by itself. But if it goes into the ground, what happens? As it dies, it comes to life. It sprouts and grows into a tall uh, sheaf of wheat or corn. And it bears more seed. And it begins, it's not by itself. Suddenly it's kind of then accompanied by many other kind of dozens, scores, hundreds of other seeds. We know that's what happened. Jesus died so that he wouldn't be by himself, as it were, but he might welcome in a whole multitude, millions of people now around the world and down through history who have come to saving faith, that we might join him in all eternity, sharing in his, his inheritance and in all his eternal blessings. That's what Jesus has done. That's what he says is going to happen. But then he goes on to say that if you want to be like him, we must follow him into the same. There is one sense a death for us to do. We must die to ourselves. We must die to having all our money for ourselves and sow it into the kingdom. We might too grow like a sheaf and that we might have dozens, scores, hundreds of seeds to, to sow and see fruits come from our lives. Hopefully you can see that this harvest principle is good. But let me tell you under three headings, headings some tangible things that is also good for. The first thing is that sowing is good for the recipients. So today, as we give our seed, as we give our money, as it were, it is going to be good for some of the people we've already seen on the video. It's going to be good for these church plants, for Krakow, for Belfast and for London Bridge. Those churches are going to be established or further established because of our giving. It's going to be good for those who are on the ground doing the work of ministry there. They're going to have more resource to do the thing that God has called them to do. It's not just good for the saints in those places. It's good for the cities in those places. It's good for London. It's good for Krakow and it's good for Belfast. As a result, there are going to be people in those cities who don't currently know Jesus, who are going to come and get to know him. That's what's going to happen. That is what has happened. It's wonderful that actually some of those people on, those, on the video are people who've come to faith because we have sown into these gift days in previous years. 
Last week, I was in Poland. I was in Krakow with that church and with the uh, church leaders of the other churches in our family. And uh, they all brought little teams with them. And uh, I met one particular guy who was just wonderful to have an evening with. And uh, over a kebab, I was just chatting about his story. And uh, he met one of our church leaders just walking down a street. They bumped into each other, had a conversation. It was clear that God was already working in his life. And he got invited into that community of believers. He's now getting established. And he's saying to me, I don't even know why I'm at this conference. I'm not a leader. What have I got to offer? And uh, I just gave him a few reassurances. But inside, I'm just thrilled. Like, God, look what you are doing in this person's life. Because I got to give him that gift campaign. Because we as a manual got to give into it. We know that church is established. That leader has time to give, to go and find others and welcome them into the kingdom. And this guy, I can see there's things that God's still working in his life, but he's got a majorly trajectory in God. He's currently a seed that's going to get planted in the ground as he dies to himself and follows Jesus as Lord. I know he's going to be fruitful for Jesus. And that's because what we've done. As we have sown, so they have begun to reap the good of it. There's already a harvest of righteousness happening in these different cities, in these different places because we have given and that will continue to be the case as we give this time as well. For the different Emmanuel churches, for Liberty, for Mosaic, for Good News in Krakow, for Cornerstone in Bath, for Grace City in Ottawa. These places are established because of you and I's giving. They are fruitful. We have this amazing promise that as we are faithful to God that we will be fruitful and fruit that will last. Some of these fruit that we've, we've kind of sowed into these cities, some will bear small fruit, some will grow large fruit, some will uh, kind of grow extraordinary fruit. One of the fruitfulness is that some of these churches are now beginning to grow fruit. As it were, there are a few seasons down the agricultural track. You'll notice that Liberty Church in Amsterdam and Mosaic Church in Berlin, neither of them feature in our video. Why not? Because they're established. They're, they are their own sheaths, sheaths of wheat. They're now bearing fruit and putting out seed into their cities and are now, now have vision to plant their own churches. They're the one now giving back into the ministry. That is good for these recipients, good for these cities, good for these saints as we sow. It is hard to sow. Parting with our money today, there is a hardship to it. But like the wise, wise farmer, as we choose to sow, instead of keep it all for ourselves, we can be sure there is going to be a harvest elsewhere. And for us, it's a harvest that we might never properly enjoy for ourselves. You may never visit Ottawa. We'll probably never really uh, encounter the people who uh, benefit from the Bible translation that Wycliffe Bible translators are doing. We won't know some of the places that Unreached Network even goes to. You'll notice if you watched Andy's videos last week, he doesn't actually mention any of those Unreached People groups. Partly because many of them, it's illegal to tell them about Jesus. Now, they've got good accountability where the money's going. Don't worry about that. We don't publicly even talk about it. But there are people in other places that some of us will never even go. And we won't meet those people maybe until eternity and see the harvest of what God has done. It is good for the places that we are sowing into. Let me encourage you, let your sowing today not be the end of your concern for those we're giving it to. Let's be a people who have concern in a place of prayer for these people. Let me encourage you to keep doing that. Let me encourage you that we're not to be those who just sow, but we're to be those who water and tend. We'll continue to check in on these churches and these things and continue to feed back to you and pray as well. Let me encourage you, get yourself a city break. Go to Amsterdam for the weekend. Go to Belfast. Go and visit these churches. Go and see some of the people who are in their seats because of your giving. The more we sow, the more people are going to be reached for the name of Jesus. So that's a good reason. Another another reason it's good, it's good for them. It's also good for you. We give today so that we also may be enriched in every way. We should be be concerned about what it does for us. The Bible has no problem with the fact that as we give, there's a reward. There's no problem in the Bible with that. As we give today, there is something about, this is good for me. Actually, as I give, I know this is good for me. Let me name some ways in which that's the case. First one is that we get to be closer to Jesus. Jesus here is his farm and he's inviting us to co-labour, to collaborate with him on the things that he's doing on the earth. Who is it uh, out there in the world that you would love to collaborate with? Maybe you're in a certain industry where there's a couple of absolute shining lights and here is I'd love to work with them. Or maybe there's a sports star, I think I'd love to kind of hit a ball with them. That's something like that. Jesus The Lord of all creation is inviting you to collaborate, to play, to harvest with him in the world. The church and Christ working together on what he's doing in the world. 
us and this amazing farm owner. And as we do that, we get closer to him. If you watch Clarkson's farm, Caleb and Jeremy have this weird relationship where Caleb gets frustrated by the, the, the kind of uh, clumsiness, the foolishness of Jeremy's farming techniques. But as you watch over the three series, it's the human interest story that really gets you. And as they begin to have real affection for one another. When you join in team and collaborate with people, actually there's a heart connection that comes as you do life with one another. The same is true with our relationship with Jesus. Are you today thinking, I'm not close, so close to Jesus right now? Let me encourage, why don't you take a step closer to him by co-laboring with him? Get involved with church more. Get on a serving team. Get in a small group. And by the way, give your money today. That's a great way to say, God, I am in. And God meets us there. If you want the Holy Spirit's help with things, we need to be in a place where we can receive help. And we live in a very rich society where often we can do life without him. Let me encourage you, get involved with Jesus by giving today and let him bring the help and the faith that you need to give. Another benefit for us is that we will be enriched and provided for. In Proverbs 11, it says, whoever brings blessing will be enriched and one who waters will himself be watered. Paul assures us as well that the God of all grace will provide an abundance to those who give. No one is going to be left in lack. There's no losers when they choose generosity. The Bible promises that we will be provided for. We don't need to be fearful. Jesus said, don't be anxious about what you'll have. The God of all heaven cares about your needs. Now, we're very careful when we preach this, that there's some cults who will say, you give this cash, this is the cash that you'll get back. No, in view here is much, something much better than that. It's much more about the heavenly, eternal blessings. That's what's envisioned here. But there is a sense about material blessing as well and God's promise to us. The more that we sow, the more we can expect that God will enrich our life. And as we sow, we can trust that God will provide for us. I also think as I was looking at this, that God is more likely to give to us when our prayer is, God, give to me so that I can give away. When God knows that it's in our heart to be generous, that generous on all occasions, in all places, God's going to give us more. When we pray, God, just meet my need or just my daily bread, God will meet that. Of course he will. He promises to. But when we say, it's just, you know, when we say, God, it's more than that, I want to give so that I can give away. I often pray for a gift day, God, whatever I get on the kind of leading to the gift day, God, you can have. Lord, if I can just be a channel of your blessing to church, then God, do it. Which is a dangerous prayer because God might give you a tenner or he might give you 10 grand and suddenly you're stuck with a covenant with God. But it's a fun prayer to pray. God, will you do something in my heart that my desire would be to sow and knowing that that can then be a channel of your blessing. It says in verse 8, God is able to bless you abundantly. God's arm is never too short. His pockets are never too shallow. No, his arm is strong. His pockets are deep. All grace abound to you. Grace unmerited, not deserving, a gift to you. Abundant, overflowing, plentiful, numerous. Because I'm to say all sufficiency, not lacking, not scrimping, so that we never have to worry. So that we can abound in every good work in every time. Another benefit is that God sanctifies us, makes us more like Jesus. God is committed to take us from one degree of glory to another, giving us a great way for that to happen. Helps us to kill selfishness, kill materialism, kill the idol of mammon. That's the idol of money that can rear its head in all of our lives. One of the commentators I was reading this week says, it's a great spiritual health check to say, is our giving regular? Is it free and generous? Is it proportionate to the way God has blessed us? Is it a significant proportion of our income? Is it sacrificial? Is it something that is prayed over? Do we view it rightly as worship or as some sort of tax or a deplorable necessity or an unmentionable subject? When it comes to giving, it's an opportunity to have a look at our hearts, look at our desires and say, are they godly? Do they match up with who God wants me to be? Maybe today is a day for God just to knock some edges of some of us. It's also good for us because it's a call to adventure, call to courage, call to sacrifice, call to mission. Paul had discovered that by giving, that it was a part of a living an exhilarating life. He practiced what he preached. He's not asking the Corinthians to do anything he hasn't done. In fact, Paul went to great extremes. He's giving up home and security. He's giving up a considerable fortune and secure prospects for the sake of the gospel. And he wants this church to share in it too. He wants us as a church to share in it as well. 
the more we sow, the more that we will grow, the more that we will be sanctified and enriched and come closer to God. One last thing before we finish. What's another good of this? God's glory. As we sow, God gets more glory. Yes, it's good for those who get the money, to get the seed as it were. Yes, it's good for us, those who give. But ultimately, we care most about the fact that God is going to receive glory. He's going to receive worship, going to receive honour and thanksgiving. Giving our money, giving of ourselves an act of worship to our beautiful, glorious, all-deserving, all-loving and faithful God, to the lover and saviour of our soul. That's what our giving does. But our giving also results in thanksgiving and worship. It is the beautiful byproduct of our giving that others are going to begin to give thanksgiving to God. As we reach out in prayer and in material care by giving today, other people are going to begin to lift their voices and our hands to God. Elsewhere it says that others will see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven or benefit from your good deeds. There are going to be more Christians around the world and around the throne with Jesus for all eternity because of today's giving. And because of our giving down through the centuries, the centuries, down through the years, sorry. And we are on a mission to plant churches and translate the Bible and go to the ends of the earth because we want to see more worship. Why are we doing it today? Is it just because we like giving? Is it because we like having more churches called Emmanuel in other places? No, it's because we want Jesus to get more worship. Mission exists because worship does not. Mission exists because we want to see more people giving glory and honour to Jesus. God gets the glory in the giving and in the getting. Our desire is that the recipients might thank God, not us. It's nice when they send messages saying, thank you for the gifts you sent. But ultimately, we want them to thank Jesus and to come to know him. That's why Paul in verse 12 says that he kind of talks about this offering as being this service. And the commenters say it's kind of an allusion to this sacred service, this godly service. Really, it's an act of worship. Which is not surprising when we see in James 1 that our acts of service come with giving and compassion on others. So let me encourage you today, as you consider giving, don't give. Don't give unless you are giving out of worship and love for God. God wants a heart of worship, a heart of generosity and a heart of cheerfulness today. Decide in your heart that if it's not worship, we don't want you to give. Uh, you know, we want this to be a big, kind of large total. Of course we do, because we want to give as much as we can to other churches. But we don't want to do the expense of you not worshipping as the Bible would instruct us. But that's given away today. So that we can exclaim with Paul right in that very last verse where it says, Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Today, we're not even thanking God for the gifts that we're giving. We're thanking him for his gift, his gift of Jesus that Jesus came to the earth, that he was buried like this seed of wheat in the ground, that he might grow up into this sheaf of wheat, that we might then be sown out with the seeds of the gospel and come into life and share all that he has. The more we sow, the more worship and thanksgiving there will be to this God who has done this for us. Let me pray for us as we consider, consider our giving. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for Christ's sacrificial love for us, Lord God. No one has done what you have done for us. And we say that anything we give today, even if we gave all that we have, is just a pale response to the glorious gift that you have given to us, Lord. And so, Lord God, we pray, help every heart now to engage in, engage in this in the way that you would want us to, Lord God. We do pray for a great total, Lord God, but more than that, Lord, we pray that more thanksgiving will be given to you, that more glory and honour and worship will be given in this moment as we give, but also in the weeks, the months and years to come as this money is spent on the kingdom of your God, your kingdom advancing, and for your gospel to run right in the earth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.